Good evening, Guam, and welcome to KUAM News is the after party where we discuss all the hot uh, stories of the last month. And I'll uh, go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists. For my ill co host, Sabrina Salas Matanani, my name is Chris Barnett, of course. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Chris Zimbrowski, and former Senator Fernando Estevez. Off a day. And from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto Rico. Juan Carlos uh, Benitez from the, the GOP. And let's just start there. Uh, you know, Delegate uh, Mike Sinekles uh, making a, what I like to call a rare Guam appearance uh, before the legislature. Uh, you know, uh, Senator Mary Torres introduced a uh, resolution basically um, saying, hey, we support the uh, payment of SSI to Guam residents. And so um, pretty interesting uh, resolution hearing. To me, uh, one of the things that kind of stuck in my mind was the way uh, Delegate San Nicolas pronounced Puerto Rico. And how do you say it, just for the record? Puerto Rico. Okay. And yeah. what did you think of his pronunciation? A little much or just right? He had a lot of emotion into it. There's a lot of emotion, a right? A lot of emotion. And I, I, we but, talked I, but I give him on a, on a good attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Senator. No, no I mean, I, I appreciate the, the additional articulation you're putting into that, you know what I mean, to show, like, you know, give give homage to right. to another territory, but I mean, you you don't go around being like and Guam. Yeah. Yeah. At least call us by our lead, problem, you know, right? your official name. Give that much give that much detail and attention to to Guam's actual name, right? Right. You right. know, Guahan. Right. You know, at least that. I mean, all things being equal. But I mean, with regards to all of that, let me just to be fair. I think it's a great piece of legislation. You know, I think I'm I'm very happy about that. I right. think it is it is a good fight to have. So let me just, you know, be fair and equal and say that, that the, the legislation itself is great. The resolution supporting it was great. But that was definitely, I think, was a funny point. You know, if I, if I So I wasn't it, the only one. No, no, no. Okay. I, I caught it and I was like, that's, that's interesting because it really stands out, right? It does, you know? yeah. And it's, and, you know, the thing with, like, you know, when you hear Juan speak, right? You know, he speaks and even though he's, he's speaking English, there's an accent and it's accepted, right? It's his native tongue, his mother right. tongue. So, but, you know, it's like when you hear... So and you see it on the federal side too, right? Uh, you saw it with AOC. Right. That was you know that was funny. Well, she she talks switches a her game way, up, right? Then yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. You know, like all of a sudden, I'm from the Bronx, <laughs> which not even how they talk in the Bronx. Right. Let me just yeah. be clear. Not, I don't Forget know where about it. <laughs> you must hate the thing that's in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's his guy. <laughs> hey, let's save the fireworks for a little bit later. Yeah. All right. But, but I have to say that the. The main issue was the su supplemental Social Security. Right on. And uh, it is a hard issue. It needs to be pushed. Uh, really pushed. Pu Puerto Rico has an edge. Puerto Rico has an edge. Ba based on the, uh, the recent ruling by the Federal District Court in Puerto Rico, uh, Federal Judge uh, Galpi uh, uh, declared that it, that it was unconstitutional. So uh, you're saying a judge in Puerto Rico declared that it was unconstitutional for... Federal district judge. Right, okay. Uh, based on, on the alienation of the rights on a particular case. Unfortunately, that judge doesn't have jurisdiction over the territories in the Pacific. Right. Uh, so we need to figure how we get our federal district judge to be presented with the same or extremely similar uh, situation that would allow her or give her the discretion to actually review the matter. Right. Um, having said that, the federal government is obviously appealing to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and we'll see where that ruling goes. Uh, but Judge Gilpie wrote a very, 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 very solid opinion. I remember opinion. you sent that to me, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm very hopeful, uh, and I hope that this gets the momentum through Congress, but it's, it's a, it comes with a very uh, steep price tag. Uh, yeah for the federal government, so we'll, we'll see where yeah. it goes. And so I mean, I think it was, you know, they're going to fight it. They're $40 million dollars for Guam, I think, was the number they were, they were putting out there, right? Yeah, a, that a would year. be a year. A year. A year. A year. The, the, we're not the big price tag. The big price tag is Puerto really Rico. Puerto Rico. It's Puerto Rico, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So how realistic is that, Senator Stevens? And, you know, i got to give credit to the delegate. I mean, these are big picture items that no, he's I mean, pursuing. I've been really happy with, with that particular thing. You know, I mean, we may, you know, have disagreed in the past on certain things. But when it comes to, like, territorial issues, especially about equity when it comes to the federal government, I right. think we can see eye, eye, eye to eye on that, right? And so anything that, that we should be able to get that should be afforded to us, it's worth having the conversation and it's worth arguing, not only at the local level, but even at the federal level, and always and constantly bringing these uh, issues up to light. 
Um, you know, I joke about how he uses Puerto Rico, but it's because he's fostered a relationship with with them, some of the leadership over there. And, and I couldn't understand that because we need to find allies, right? Right, right. So allies on te territorial issues, you know, Guam's like 185,000 people, Puerto Rico's 3.2 million. And so when we could find commonality on certain issues, I think there's a lot of benefit. Um, but I think also strategically, we need to know when not to align 100%, right? Because we can't just say all territories are the same. That kind of hurts our cause right. as much as it would hurt their cause potentially. And then I think you got to be careful too with Tanana because Tanana is going to tell you like, oh, go be Puerto Rico's delegate then. <laughs> no, of course. You want to talk about Puerto course. Rico all the time. And, 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 it's, and it's a balance, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's a balance. you got to, I think, really understand your constituency. You know, I mean, we got to, if we're going to come and we're going to really delve into and try to understand what's going on in Guam and have multiple town halls. You know, I think we, if we're going to go and do it a certain way, then I think we should go. go you mean the right Guam. way and the well, no, I mean, way or whatever, whatever web method. I mean, you know, right he on. was elected however he wants to do it. But, you know, if you're going to have those kinds of town halls, then, you know, I don't know when they're going to schedule the Native American town hall and you and know, this was something else, Doc. I mean, these different ones. The delegate had come out on uh, Instagram and said that he's going to have a Filipino town hall. Uh, so, what do you think of that? Do we do we have do we need to break down our town halls by ethnic group? No or? borders. Yeah. Yeah. No borders. My wife and kid live in Bayawan, the Grocery Oriental. Would love to bring them here, without going through all the problems with the embassy right. and what have you, and waiting six months. And so there are and definitely no some issues that yeah, yeah. definitely okay. It's great. You know, it, it's uh, Guam is a melting pot. There's a uh, large populations from from different ethnic backgrounds in, in our island, and recognizing that they exist and that they might have uh, issues that are specific to them and in their life experience in Guam, it, you know, it's commendable. I think it's it's fine. I hope he doesn't limit it just to one group that he that's really right, yeah. goes. And that, that's kind of what I'm yeah. saying, right? Yeah. If and and that's where it can be. It can be tricky I think politically right if you're going to go down the way that's fine right like I said it, it's very admirable if you want to pay that much attention to one group or another I, th I think it's commendable and I think it, it really fits that potentially fits the Democrat platform but then you have to be consistent you can't right leave on. anybody out right because so when I heard that right away I thought oh when's the Tremoran Tunnel or you know what I mean? yeah it's only obvious and 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 you know I don't want to be like too critical too quick right because right. the jury's still out that could be coming up maybe you know, I don't know, maybe he's getting a lot of requests because, as he said, maybe visa issues. Sure. Understandable. Right on. But, again, once you go down that 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 road, right, either you're going to be totally inclusive or totally inclusive, which means you're going to be totally inclusive, let's get everyone in here, and that's how I'm going to operate. Or if I'm going to go and, and, and go that extra mile and give special attention, I have to give special attention to everybody and all of their unique issues. And I, and I think tough, there's a lot tough, of... It's, yeah. it's tough, but, you know, it could be something that works out really great. I just hope that it doesn't remain with one particular group because that would be the difference between going out and really trying to understand your constituents versus pandering to one particular group. Yeah, and I, and I look at it uh, as the delegate. Is, he's kind of, you know, rallying... Potentially, what could be his troops in the next, you know, the next election? Oh, let's have a Filipino town hall. Let's push these SSI issues. So, real piecemeal, I see him kind of talking to these different groups in the hopes that down the road, you know, maybe their support will will be there. You know, when when uh, when um, as he um, continues his uh, present uh, wonderful relation with Puerto Rico. Uh, Love affair. Maybe. Uh, we we uh, <laughs> we should look. You know, uh, Puerto Rico just asked the Trump administration for an 18 months exception of the Jones Act uh, to explore how it would impact the shipping in, and the cost of uh, life in Puerto Rico, particularly after the storm. You know, maybe, maybe it would be interesting if the congressman were to request uh, to be included in that 18 months exception yeah. and see what the difference in prices would be here in Guam. Right, should, right. Uh, the Jones Act not I want to add around. a horse to historical yeah. background because the crazy thing with Puerto Rico, right, was when the, everything happened in the Gulf, yeah. they, they made complete exceptions to the Jones Act for all the emergency ships coming in. And that was that with, also with the oil spill, the big mm. uh, BP oil spill yeah. in the Gulf. Yeah. But after the storm happened in Puerto Rico, there was no such exception, e exemption granted for Puerto Rico. So I like territorial issues even at the federal level. 
um, are are huge, are yeah. huge, and we have yeah. to leverage those and and kind of focus on established, uh, uh, I guess, uh, precedent that's been put out. I think know? it's interesting that uh, delegates and Nicholas has kind of done a 180 from uh, a lot of the stances that he did in the legislature. I remember in the legislature, he was that guy who was like, "Don't talk smack about Uncle Sam." Yeah. Why are you hating on the buildup? And now I think he's found that. It's politically convenient to beat up on Uncle Sam being the delegate because you don't have a vote, and he's a convenient um, well, bullseye. You the know, other, you keep, you keep hitting on him, too, and he can't hit back. And you know, the other thing too is, I guess at his level, I guess the the federal government is the Trump administration, right? Right. So it's kind of a, a win-win. I see. Right? right. You you hitting on Uncle Sam on your territorial issues and is also a smack at. At the Republicans and at the the Commander in Chief, pretty easy target. Doc. It's an easy target right now. So you know what happens now, though. I'm saying for him, right? right? If yeah. you're on the other side, and sure. you know, and it's it's politically convenient to be opposition. That's like the easiest position to be in. Is you need opposition. to tell the Republicans so, in the legislature that because they're pretty quiet. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, <laughs> True. So I, I have to defend my Republican colleagues and. Uh, uh, the only reason that the territorial members of Congress don't have a vote on the floor is because the floor rules don't allow it. Yeah. And it, could, it would be extremely easy for the Democratic leadership to decide that they're going to give the votes on the floor yeah. to the territorial delegates. And, uh, but I didn't see any movement this time. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah. normally when the Democrats take over, they, they give a symbolic vote, right? They right. say you can vote on the floor, but if it's a margin of difference on passage of the bill, then it doesn't count. Uh, but I could see somebody like San Nicolas coming in and saying, look, if Bring you're going to give us the vote, if you're going to agree with right. the vote, <laughs> made, made, made it count. Right? Yeah, no, and, yeah, uh, yeah. But no one, not a single word or peep has come out from yeah, anybody I mean, on it. They've been very quiet. I mean, and, and you can see it go down the list that historically, at least on the federal level, and that's why I, you know, I, I'm not o overly critical of the difficulty that he has in Washington, right? You're a very small fish in a big pool. Sure. And I think uh, Dr. Underwood's kind of talked about that. But historically, like, doesn't matter, Democrat, Republican administration, um, Democrat, Republican house, you're, you're going to see that no one party has been better with the territories. Um, pretty but, consistent. Yeah, pretty consistent. Right. And I think, like, at least for the Republican parties, and one of the things that appealed to me most is that regardless of who gets voted in, whether or not they're 100% for and, and they're paying extra attention to the territories, the one thing I like is just that fundamentally there's that acceptance that one size fits policy does not work. Right. And it's not that, we, you know, that's the one thing I like about the Republican Party. And so being from Guam, I like that at least it gives you a little bit of 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 a say in what's going on right in terms of somebody deciding everything that's going on in your life thousands of miles away without ever having to be accountable to you right and so you know things like you know health care and everything else so i think i think historically you know you couldn't say the republicans or democrats have been better to the territories but at least at a fundamental level there are still a lot of anti-federalists in the republican party okay i gotta interrupt this sure. uh, republican party commercial uh, <laughs> take it over to Doc. Doc, uh, Doc we got to talk about the legalization of uh, adult use cannabis. I mean, I remember 1997, 1998, you were passing around a petition, uh, the COM petition, Chamorro Alliance for the Legalization of Medicinal Marijuana. We marched in the uh, Liberation Day Parade. Right. You sent me some pictures of that and really a flashback. And I got to say, you were ahead of your time. Touchdown! <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, it's, it's really depressing because the only reason why cannabis was placed on Schedule 1 was because of lies, power, institutionalized racism, and it took us 51 decades, 50, I'm sorry, 51 five. years, five decades, to get to where we are in Guam. And it's sad because when you think of the anti-vaxxers out there, the, the flat earthers out there, the dumbing down of America... That was a perfect example of it. Mm -hmm. For all these decades, for a 10-year-old kid like me to watch what Richard Nixon did and to follow it through as I went through college and medical school, I mean, it's scary. It's scary the level of incompetency in, in our general community. The fact that the gateway effect was still being discussed, my, it's mind-blowing. That is just mind-blowing. And it was and being now, discussed now by... Now we have by... to deal with climate change. 
Mm -hmm. And people are saying we have till 2030. I don't think we're doomed. We're screwed. If if it took five decades to get a plant out of a out of a controlled substance, and we haven't done that yet, the holy grail is to get cannabis off the schedule, right, mm -hmm. and make it like oregano. Well, it, it's that's been introduced, the holy right? grail. Yeah. Otherwise, we're still dealing with power, politics, lies, institutional racism. Fair enough. Well, there you go. Juan, I know you're a big opponent of the uh, adult use uh, cannabis. I got to say to the big opponents, though, the arguments were made that um, along the lines of the sky is falling. And, you know, I don't know if the sky hasn't fell yet because we don't have the, you know, the rules and regs from the cannabis uh, board. But um, the immediate effect, have you seen well, any damaging effects? Like, I, I think we're about a month into the legalization of adult use cannabis. Uh not nothing that I can really point out outside of people are not following the law, but uh, and they're smoking in public places and the police is not enforcing it. Uh, and uh, and and my bigger concern, which is the unintended consequences right. of this action on our immigration community here, our permanent residents, and our visitors and. That has a big, big, big potential uh, of having huge negative effects. Right, right. And we'll see where it comes or it doesn't. All and just let the record show you were the guy who was saying that. Well, well, all, all I all I want on the record to show is that we at least informed the community right. and said, be aware of it. This could cost you your job. This has ramifications on your ability to stay in the United States. This could separate your family. So if you're going to make a decision, you need to make an informed decision of the impact that that's going to have on your life. And you know what I appreciate about you, Juan, is that I remember when we first discussed this issue, you appeared to oppose it on moral grounds. And then you kind of walked that back to the more uh, the grounds that it affects, you know, people in your line of work. You're an immigration lawyer. And you said, hey, Chris, uh, people could be deported for this. Uh, like you said, unintended consequences. So, yeah, I think in 2019, uh, the morality argument, it doesn't really fly anymore. And. I was kind of disappointed to see the way the senators discussed this on, on the floor because there was just a lot of, I felt like, irresponsible uh, fear-mongering. Well, there were so many different, like, thoughts on it. And, yeah. and that's fair, right? That's yeah. what, and I think that's why the, the party, as what I could tell, right, um, the, that's why they wanted the referendum. It was kind of a big, big decision. Right. And, and, you know, people have different thoughts on that. And I just think this being such a big decision, right, it, I'm okay, right? I'm such a, you know, you could kind of say I'm a... I'm a Liberal Republican? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with people having personal responsibility. Right on. Making their own choices for themselves, right? Exercising their freedom um, and having to live with those consequences, right? You know, there's always kind of a, a pull, push-pull and, and a good and bad. So I think based on that, I think it was important that the decision be put in people's hands because, yes, they're potentially unforeseen consequences good or, or bad right that we're not necessarily aware of right could it have an effect on our tourism economy that was never really answered right we're not sure but i think as a people i'm perfectly fine with us as a people if if, if it's decided that we want to do something that maybe not everybody agrees with mm -hmm. that's either good or bad that we can decide that as a people in a community but that's why a decision like that is is big enough i believe just like medicinal cannabis was um, to go for a referendum. And when everyone right. said, well, we don't want a referendum because then it would never happen. We have eight votes now. Well, you know, you don't necessarily rush policy just because you, you, ha you can pass it at that time, right? If something's a good idea, then it's going to pass the test of public scrutiny, you know, at that level. And, and I think that was the position um, that the party came out. And it was a position right. that I've gone on the record consistently. Um, not to say that I don't I remember personally. in the election you brought this, this same point up. Yeah. Why did Governor Calvo pull back his personal use? Well, as I, I can't speak for the governor. I can't speak for the governor. I don't know why he pulled back. What I can assume was because I had brought up concerns, not directly to them, but the same thing, because I had been asked by constituents, right? I'm a supporter, uh, you know, and, and, and I'll go on the record to say I'm a supporter of medicinal. I'm supportive of recreational, given that certain rules are in place on to enforcement, yeah. right? Details matter right. to me, right, as a, as a citizen. Um, but I was always kind of concerned, you know, I, I respect the opinion that they got that 
it didn't violate the Organic Act. But, you know, my interpretation, and, you know, everybody has different interpretations. Mm -hmm. You go to one lawyer, they're going to say it's not. You're going to go to another lawyer, and we've seen Very that. easy to get second opinions e in this exactly. community. Exactly. And, and the one thing that I was always sure of, right, is that if we did it through a referendum, there's nothing that explicitly prohibits, it prohibits, says the legislature right can't on. pass a law that goes against federal law. And that was it, kind of the basis for Sed Freeland Songen's uh, lawsuit. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and that happened right after. Right. But, but I think it's clear. If you read the, the Organic Act, that they cannot pass legislation that goes against federal law. Mm. It's, and if you see the opinion from the, the <clears throat> position of the Attorney General today, Right? It's, it's not that he's disagreeing with that interpretation. He's saying, you don't have standing. Yeah. You, you, the one that needs to bring this up is me, and I'm not going to bring it up. Right on. You know? So he's using his discretion. He's using yes. his discretion. But that doesn't mean somebody else couldn't potentially challenge who of might course. have standing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that things can change. And, yeah. and now the risk, right, and we want to talk details. The risk is that, let's say we have all these industries and they invest money, cold, hard cash. And then we get sued and, and then they something overturn happens, the law. We're they're the ones that are right. going to eat that. And that is a concern for me. I'm sure. not like oh, an anti-pot guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about potentially them. Like if we're not crossing our T's, dotting our I's, if we're doing something like right. the land bill, the land tax bill, and we're not paying attention, you know, one simple mistake, you know, they're going to come knocking. And so if you look too, because we did the, rec the research, I mean, there's most of the states that have a recreational law. Have done it through it. referendum. Exactly. Yes, yeah. uh, Doc, I got to tell you, and speaking with Governor Cabo on this uh, in the past, I know that one of the reasons that he had pulled it back was because there was such a knee-jerk negative reaction, like we saw with this from uh, GVB, and I think a few other uh, people had brought up those concerns. And I don't think he pulled it back as a, I, I don't support it. I think at the time it was pulled back to kind of go out and feel out those concerns, which we learned in this latest round of uh, adult use cannabis legalization that those concerns were never addressed. GVB never did a study, they never, and, and I feel like we kind of take what we can get, right? I know that the administration had said in the campaign they supported it, we had uh, eight senators who supported it, and you're right, I mean, they did rush it through, did they? Yeah, they did, yeah. But, but I felt like they saw an opening and they took it. If it was the Republicans and a bill that you guys Maybe not adult use cannabis, yeah. but something and else that you favored, you would have done the same thing. I, I, yeah, yeah, and that's fair. I, I, I agree. Yeah. And that comes with then they're going to be either right or wrong, right. right, on the majority of the population in Guam, whether this is something they actually supported them and elected them to pass and felt that this was the main issue that were driven to do. I don't think it was the main issue, but I think that... that it's one of the first things that they passed. No, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Because I don't think, to be fair, it was, yeah. it was, you know, they ran, right, being... They ran, though, and they, they had promised to do it. So right, it was right. filling a campaign promise. Sure. And I do have to tip my hat, right? We don't have to agree on all the details of how everything does, mm -hmm. but Senator Rigel made a commitment. He did. And he saw it through. And, and, you know, you have to respect that, whether right. you agree or not. You yeah. know, I, I think that's, you know, major props for that, right? That's sure. politics, right? Yeah. Nothing's going to be 100 or 1,000% <clears> to anybody's likings, right? Right. And, and it's great we can have kind of civil debate about it and talk about the little nuances and right. details. I think that for me, the bottom line what wasn't moral. It was just as something as simple as the personal freedom. If you can go out and drink whiskey or if you can, you know, have a 12 pack in your house, you should be able to spark a joint. But I mean, I'm, just, glad, I'm glad you bring that up though, because I think well, we're, we're, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, Doc. From, I'm, I'm talking From a medical yeah. perspective, <laughs> if you, you know, personal freedom is right. I mean, look at the people. One of the reasons why we don't have free healthcare is because of the people who eat in this corporate crap and they're developing diabetes, and they're obese, and they're coming down with heart attacks, strokes, getting their feet and their hands cut off, going blind. And that's personal responsibility right there. Mm -hmm. But um, well, if, if we're going to be dishing out morality, let's spread it out. I'm not dishing out morality. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, you but, know but, but you know, something that for me was interesting when the entire debate came is every single senator wanted to support this and fight for it, kept bringing up medical reasons right if you're going to support it because you think it's a right that everybody should be allowed to smoke marijuana for whatever reasons they want then stand up and say that right don't come in and say you know i'm doing it because it's the only way we're going to get medical protections and that's it you yeah. know it, it 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 is and then when when the accidents happen I mean, and other things sure. get deported 
Don't come in and say, well, I did it because it was the only way to get medical stuff. Right. No, you did it because you thought it was a right and it was something that you felt that people should do. Yeah. Well, here, here's the crazy thing. But I think that that's how they built a lot of support for it, too, because, like, all those people who were left hanging on the medicinal, they said, hey, this is the way you're going to get in. We're going to get you guys yeah. in on this. Right. Yeah. yeah. When we did uh, the Chamorro Association for the legalization right. of medical marijuana, our goal was once we got that pass, we would, we would take the second M and throw it away, and the next day come out with the Chamorro Association <laughs> for the legalization of marijuana. Guys, so uh, we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. I, wanna, I, don't, I don't know if you guys want to touch on uh, the Chief Ignacio issue, State of Island Address, Transition Fund. Go ahead, we'll pick. I what? mean, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll bring the Chief Ignacio. It's, right. It's actually, uh, I'm, I'm. Uh, Pretty interesting. I don't, I don't really know him. And right. I think he sounds like he's a wonderful guy from what I heard from everybody that knows him. But I do have to say that it, was, it brought serious concerns to me that the administration got a negative result from a psychologist, and they try to refute it by a general practitioner instead of looking for a second psychologist, psychiatrist to overturn that decision or review it. What are your thoughts, Doc? It's all about mental illness and our lack of expression to talk about anxiety, stress, and tension. My thought was that the chief should have just, could have just put everything in its tracks by saying, listen, I get depressed every now and then. I mean, being a police officer is one of the toughest jobs sure. on the planet next yeah. to being an uh, infantryman in, in the Army or the military. Right. Uh, but it, it should become second nature to each of one of us to talk about our anxieties, our tension, that leads to depression or boredom or what have you to talk about something that was supposedly so insignificant, but yet so important that it prevented him from moving on. And we'll never know. We'll, we'll, Hopefully we'll never find out because yeah, that is HIPAA, HIPAA yeah. law and, and what have you. But it's a shame that we can't talk about. And well, 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 the thing for me was at the end of the day, it did come to public light. And he did take a, a second evaluation by the same doctor who, <laughs> found, who cleared him. Right. Right. And uh, how hard uh, was that? Right. Yeah. yeah. Why? why my, my issue is why? Why didn't we try to follow that? And you know, it's not like it's the only psychologist, psychiatrist in the island. Yeah. We have a number of them. They do right. work on the court all the time and yeah. on, on the prison system. Well, a couple of thoughts on that. I think I think you're absolutely right. It, it's not that no one's saying you know he's not fit. The, the second opinion or second evaluation. I mean, with those questions, sometimes it can be the matter of just, just that day right. and, and how you answer the questions and do the test. But I think what was, was really horrifying was that with, with the administration is that, you know, you're going to have Adelou put it out and, and our governor is totally nurse, failed. Yeah. Well, failed. put out something to try to convince me, right, or right. convince yeah. him that, oh, the second opinion's done. It was a family practice doc. You instead know, of trying to instead throw of the, another psychologist right. or a subspecialty, <laughs> no, really, it's no, I have a tiebreaker. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. and then let's, let's <laughs> best run. out of three. <laughs> let's rush I think, it I think you're right. I've, unfortunately, we're, we're out of yeah. time. I just want to close this by saying I think the real losers in, in this whole story was the administration with the way they handled it and the way they tried to downplay uh, psychologists' uh, unfit for duty evaluation, and then uh, Chief Ignacio also lost because of all the questions that this threw on his uh, leadership ability. The chief is a great guy. Uh, he's one of the um, few cops who became chief by moving up the ranks. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he has a support department. Every cop I talked to, uh, they love him. And I thought it was really unfortunate that uh, his good character uh, got dragged through the mud by yeah. people who were purporting to support him. So, And they rushed it through, yeah. the, the confirmation. So I think the people who did the most damage on his uh, character and his standing were the people who, were, who wanted him to be the chief of police. All right, Agreed. Doc, thank you. Thank you. Senator. Thank you, Chris. Juan Carlos. Thank you. All right, hey, Chris Barnett, this has been the KUM News uh, After Party. All out of time, got to go. Esta, adios. Closed captioning is brought to you by IT&E. Explore your world.